Questions? Yes. Kia. Kia Lundqvist from University of Turku. Uh, I would uh, address Katya and, uh, and Katarina. When you're talking... We are both Katarina. Oh, sorry. Yes. Huh? Okay. But, uh, but when you talk refugees, are you talking asylum seekers? Or what, whom are you talking about? Because I had uh, problems now, now understanding when I try to convert this to fin the Finnish system. Because if, if you have a refugee status, but you are uh, in Finland, uh, the systems are open for you to, to apply, of course, and we have a lot of, of, of systems. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the challenge is, is, is to, to address the asylum seekers if they want to join. So, so, so what I, I, I would like you to clarify. Yeah, yeah. When I I speak about refugees, I speak about people who has the recognition of their status. I'm talking about asylum seekers, and I'm talking about refugee-like situation. I mean, people who has this situation but don't want to to seek for the asylum. Okay. And in the case of people who are in the university course, they are inter legally. They are international students coming from Syria, coming from Afghanistan. Really, they are in a refugee-like situation. But right now, legally, they are here as international students. But we treat them as refugee-like situation. And the protocol that I said that has been approved in May 2018 take, takes into account the different situations the legally recognized refugee and asylum seeker and the other situation. Because it's probably you don't know, but Spain refuses the 75% of the applications for asylum. So it's very hard to achieve the status here. Uh, in our case, uh, from the 23 refugee teachers, teachers, 21 had an official uh, status as uh, um, how do you say that? Um, <laughs> refugee <laughs> in Austria, <laughs> and two um, were still not having the official status, but uh, the chances are very high in Austria when you come from Syria that you get it. So. We can continue comparing with the University of Turku, so we also have problems okay. for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question of understanding to Kati. Um, I'm not sure if I got it right. So there may be uh, students apply for this program who are still living in Syria and so on. Yeah. How do they get to know about your program? I was just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that when we have the goal ready for the scholarship, we disseminate it among different stakeholders. We have ties with NGOs working in Palestine, working in Lebanon, working in Jordan. We are part of, we are partnered actually of the rescue project that, uh, well, in, in this rescue project there are universities in Lebanon, in north of Iraq, and in, uh, in Jordan as well. But if you have, uh, I don't know, <laughs> NGOs, or you have connection with NGOs in, in any place of the world where there are violence or war, please contact me because <laughs> in, in January, February next year, we will have the, the goal ready and we will start again the third phase, the third year of the S course. So thank you in advance if you contact me given this information. Thank you very much. Uh, Masi, being very inspiring listening to you <coughs> three, <coughs> but more so with the programs you have for refugees, talking about Katrina and the other Katrina. Also, I have a question. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. 
First, um, Catherine from uh, Austria. This is specific to you. You talk about 10,000 staff, having 10,000 staff members and this diversity course um, that staff members have to take. Um, do you know, is it compulsory? Is it something that every staff member have to take this course or is um, an optional thing? Then? And how many, if you can guess, I don't know if you have any official data about how many of the staff currently have taken this course and if it has any impact on their practices at all. I know this is, how I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. And to both of you then, my second question, I think it's very inspiring like I talked about. But when you talk, when I hear you, you talk about refugees only from Syria. I know currently there is a war and so it makes sense that we focus on them. But they are not the only refugees in these countries. What about the other refugees coming from other countries? Do you have anything for them? Now, okay, um, about training staff members in diversity issues, that is always a hard thing to do. Um, we have administrative staff and we have teaching staff, so these are two different staff categories. And uh, the, the academic staff has to run through a basic didactic training, um, and diversity is part of that. But what is new is the, the training for administrative staff as well. So that is basically librarians, um, secretaries, all, all kinds of administrative staff members, but it's not compulsory for them, it's optional. Um, I don't have any numbers how many people run through it, but um, it's, it's new and obviously um, the rectorate sees um, a, ne a necessity to offer something um, also for administrative staff, not only for teaching staff, which is great. Um, the second question was about other refugees from other countries. Um, now that we have the second course going on with refugee teachers, um, we also have single other refugee teachers from other countries, one from Iraq, one from Iran, one from Afghanistan, and I think one from Russia. So we we are basically open as long as uh, the refugee teachers fulfill the criteria. Um, for example, they have to have teaching experience and so on. But basically, we're not uh, we're not focused on Syria. But in Syria, a lot of them were were here, and a lot of them were registered in the unemployment service. So. Yeah, in our case. It we were focused in Syria because of this situation in 2015, but we are not close. Actually, at the course, there, there are Syrian people, but there are Afghan uh, people from uh, Serbia, Russia. I mean, they are, they are Syrian are the 80 percent of the people the, of the students, but we don't want to focus only in Syria because we are aware that the violence, the war is everywhere and I, I, will, I would like to say that the scholarship is not for all the students from Syria. It's dedicated to people who are in a very vulnerable situation. Okay, This is because we want to, to work with NGOs, with NGOs that are in the ground that can say or certificate that this person has a very difficult situation because there are threats, because there are, you know, that kind of uh, scenarios. So this is the main aim of the scholarship. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Josephine Finn from the National University of Ireland, Maynooth uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, I just wanted to maybe turn to Henrietta for a moment, if I could, because I thought your presentation was very um, illuminating for me. I'm very aware of the European higher education area, uh, but sometimes we do forget the communiques that are brought through our ministries of education, and I don't think we utilize them enough. So it's more a comment, really, than a, than a question, I guess. Um, so I wanted to thank you for highlighting those things and for also drawing attention to the breadth of the European higher education area, which again is very often forgotten and is seen as kind of the EU, which is a different um, 
animal, as it were, altogether. Um, one of the things I did uh, notice, though, in your presentation, when you were talking about community-based education uh, and community-based research in particular, um, and I suppose one of the, the things that is, is an approach that is Maybe, I'm not so sure if it's unique to Maynooth University, but certainly to our department, we use it uh, in a very specific way. Universities have this uh, kind of service system that they have where they send out uh, undergraduates or graduates or postgrads into communities to do research with communities. Um, and we would be very um, much in line with um, Zara's position, which is that really the role of the university is to support the communities, <coughs> excuse me, to do research on themselves. So <coughs> I think it's really, um, we're coming to a phase where we need migrants and refugees to be bringing their own research uh, in support with the university, back into the university to tell us exactly how we should be going about this. And I think the European higher education area that is promoting diversity could start to think about how this could be done as a, a new research approach. Um, and um, I think it's, you know, the, again, if you, if you think of what George was saying, the president of Gutenberg University about looking for good ideas, I think there are very, very good ideas in a lot of the lifelong learning adult education centres and universities where practices that are used on the ground have been shown over and over again to bring, you know, successful outcomes. Small initiatives, we were talking earlier about kind of comprehensive and much wider kind of policies, but small initiatives can teach us an awful lot and can influence change greatly. But if they're ignored and if we're constantly reinventing the wheel going back to what my colleague Pat has been saying, we have a lot of experience for the last 40 or 50 years in adult education, lifelong learning, continuing education, and they're the sites that you should go to to find out how these things can be, um, how they can be initiated. Uh, and I think it's something that's very lost in the European higher education area generally, is that these areas of interest are there for you to tap into and to develop policy out of them. So it's more commentary than anything else, but you're free to respond. <laughs> Absolutely right, and I agree with your comments. Um, perhaps just uh, two words. Um, on, first of all, how this could fit into the European higher education area and on the, the end of your comment why it sometimes really doesn't work so well. Um, you've seen the work plan for the next two years. For the first time ever, um, we're actually dealing with learning and teaching. This will have a special advisory group. It will have, I think the focus will be on pedagogics uh, and didactics, innovation in that field as uh, the commission is particularly interested in that. Um, but I am sure that Ireland will be represented in it. I couldn't see how not, as it is, you know, um, we use Ireland as a frequent example when we talk about learning and teaching. And um, I'm sure you, uh, the colleagues of your ministries will make sure that um, this is also heard in this group. Um, but, and this brings me to the, why is it rather difficult um, you know, to bring about change. In the end of the day, in those working groups, we do have stakeholders, sometimes uh, people from universities. We do have stakeholder representatives, such as us, who try then to carry the discussions to the universities and also, of course, bring the university perspective into this. But mostly we're talking ministry representation as we are talking policy. Um, so it's sometimes it's very difficult to, you know, get the link between uh, the, the different international ministries talking about what can we do at the European level than to have it trickle down all the way, and especially the other way around. I mean, EUA is one of the, I know, overall 55 representatives. We represent universities, but of course, it's one of many, uh, many voices in, in this. But um, thank you very much for your comment. And I think you would like to add something? Yeah, I would just like to add um, a line about uh, participatory um, research, um, because in our case, we subcontracted three refugee teachers to help us with developing the curriculum, because... Uh, they had been teachers before, so uh, why should we develop a curriculum without them, for them? That doesn't make any sense. So we subcontracted three of them to help us in this development phase, and that was very productive. So. And it didn't cost a lot of money. So. One more? One more? No more questions? Ah, oh, 
Uh, thanks to all the speakers for very insightful comments and uh, educating us a little bit more about how higher education might change. Uh, we are all positioned within lifelong learning, which sometimes when we talk about it, we talk about it as if it's just about universities, but it's the whole process. And I keep thinking back to what comes before lifelong learning, you know, the, the education system in general and schools and younger people that are maybe uh, not coming to university in the next coming years that want to get in and may also experience difficulties coming from families, non-traditional families. And maybe we need to be thinking a little bit more widely in terms of these connections because career services and schools maybe are going to be important in getting people onto higher education from migrant families. And then I, I also think that there's a wider debate to be had here in society in general. I'm involved in a project called Learning Cities, which is right across the world. There are cities all over the world. Uh, that And that what makes these cities special is that they bring together all the services uh, across the city uh, to deal with issues affecting people within their cities. So you have Lord Mayors and you have other departments involved coming together. And I just wonder in higher education if sometimes we're a little bit protective in how we try to deal with issues and uh, maybe we can't totally solve problems ourselves or issues. So maybe is there a need for a wider debate here across the whole? And I think someone raised, I think maybe it was Isabel talked about the political uh, consequences and the finances and all the rest of it. And maybe we need to build in those other things into the debate, you know, to really be effective. Would any of you like to comment? Sure. Uh, um, do you want to try? Well, I think... Uh, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think each of you at some point mentioned the importance of working with the municipalities and, and NGOs and outsiders. And I think that is to some extent beginning to address uh, Rob's point. Um, but uh, I agree that uh, we should take it back to the schools. Um, we should be doing this with primary school children and their parents, you know, as well as with um, students in, in universities. Okay, so thank you very much for your contributions and sitting on the stools for an hour and a half. <laughs> I must say, I couldn't do that. But, uh, uh, so thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Very interesting. And I'm sure everybody will catch you over lunch uh, to, to follow up the discussions. Thank you for your questions too. I hand to Carmen to tell you about lunch arrangements.